a good view. You be comfortable? Sorry. Uh, so, so this talk was uh, uh, improvisingly called uh, Imagination, Education, and the Neoliberal Lobotomy. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to David to elaborate. But just to say a couple of things before we begin, uh, we may very well have an impromptu uh, uh, talk by uh, Mark McGowan, the taxi driver, at about 6.30. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, does that sound good? Uh, and he'll be talking about direct action and some other things, possibly. I'll leave it up to him. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, just a 30 second reminder that um, this is a free education space. It's about demanding and, and winning and building a movement for a free education for everyone as a foundation for a decent society. Um, big act, but ultimately necessary. Also, free from certain things, free from corporate influence, state violence, austerity, all those kind of things. And uh, if you like what we're doing, please support it. We're up for people offering to do events and talk workshops, and we also have a book to sign in so we can keep you up to date with emails and a donation thing as well. But anyway, uh, uh, yeah, we'll do. Uh, anyway, over to David. Hey, um, how did that phrase lobotomy come about? Um, it was when we were writing up the statement for the space, there was a lobotomy in there somewhere, wasn't there? A meeting yeah. had to be taken out? Huh? It was kind of a conversational thing and we all went, oh, that's nice. Has somebody else has heard somebody else and thought there's about it? It's about imagination. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was a beautiful example of sort of surrealist free association and just like misheard each other and came up with a much better phrase than we would have otherwise. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about the neoliberal lobotomy of the imagination. Um, and I guess it's just a compendium of, of, of some things I've said before, but I think it's really important to say here because, I mean, perhaps I'm an inveterate optimist, but I really think we're at a point where things are starting to turn around or have the potential to do so. We might be at a really key historical moment. Um, I think that the attack on education in this country is really significant. Um, the fact that they went after education. I've often said, 2008, uh, in 2008, in a way, almost all of the traditional ideological underpinnings of capitalism and neoliberal capitalism almost completely f fell apart in an instant. Um, for, for decades, for a generation, they've been telling everybody incessantly the same story, which was that you know, there is only one way, possible way to run an economy, there is only one possible way to run a society, uh, there's only one thing that actually works that there are these people, these sort of financial geniuses, and you know, they're not very nice people, we're not supposed to like them, but they're the only people who understand value, they're the only people who know how to keep an economy running. Uh, they have this incredible wisdom, all of the smartest people in the world are sort of accumulating in the city and in Wall Street, creating these amazing computer programs. They have these astrophysicists who come up with these programs, you know, all these things you couldn't possibly understand. You have no idea what these guys are doing. Don't even try to think about it. They're much wiser than you. Um, because they understand value. They understand what things are really worth. And our entire society is really reorganized around this economic model of value. And it goes all the way from the forms you have to fill out every day, the sort of bureaucratization of life to the city, which is sort of in a way it's the ultimate, you know, apotheosis of the principle of bureaucracy, of taking paperwork and turning it into the uh, way of actually creating value. Um, and, and, you know, suddenly in 2008, we realized the entire thing was a complete lie. Uh, markets don't run themselves. These guys are, are idiots. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. They destroy the entire world economy. They couldn't understand the value of their own financial instruments. Um, so basically, the entire excuse for why we were supposed to put up with all this shit, the rising inequality, uh, the lack of democracy, was gone. Um, complete ideological bankruptcy. So what do they do? Um, the first thing they do is do a full-fledged attack on the higher educational system. And that's really interesting, because if you think about it, it makes no sense, right? Um, you know, here we have the educational system, it's got a lot of problems, but it's trundling along and educating people and doing a fairly good job and certainly not destroying the world economy. Um, here you have, so one system is working okay, you have another system doing its job so badly it almost destroys the world. Um, 
you think a logical, rational um, approach would be to take the finance, you know, financial system and make it a little bit more like the educational system. Instead, they say, no, we will take the educational system and make it more like the financial system. Now, this is not a practical decision. It can only be understood as a purely political, ideolo political ideological attack on what these guys must have been thinking is the best defense is a good offense. Um, we've got really no more justification for what we do, but um, we got to take out the opposition. Where are new ideas about value, new ideas about society, new ideas about what an economy even is or is for going to come at us? Well, the only place that's likely to produce these things is going to be the higher educational system. There are people actually have the resources to go through history and know what other things have been done, historical contextualization uh, of our current situation. So we must immediately subordinate that system to the logic of capitalism. So, you know, even discussions over whether capitalist value is meaningful or important have to be discussed in the rubric of um, this will only be legitimate if it itself produces capitalist value. It was a political move. And um, I think that one of the things that really inspired me about the student movement about 2010 is pretty much every single occupation, the first thing that they, when they declared their founding principles, the first thing they set out was, you know, education is not an economic good. It is a value unto itself. Understanding the world, we don't understand the world because it will get us more goods and services um, or a higher standard of living. You know, the reason we want to have a higher standard of living is you can go around understanding the world. Um, anything. Um, I remember at Millbank very clearly, um, I actually talked to a reporter from the Telegraph. Um, I'm not sure why, but you know, sometimes you can get a message through. And she actually wrote down what I said. I was kind of surprised. And I said, you know, I find the situation very paradoxical because these people broke a bunch of glass and everybody's going to rep be representing us as barbarians, right? But you know, think about the word barbarian. You know, it goes back to ancient Rome. Uh, People didn't call the Goths and the, Vis the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Vandals and all those sort of Hun barbarians because they broke stuff. I mean, Romans broke a lot of stuff too. So the reason they were called barbarians was because it was assumed they had no interest in art, in culture, in music, in philosophy. They were just interested in money and power, and that's all they cared about. <laughs> well, who are the barbarians then? You know, the guys breaking the glass are doing so because they aren't barbarians and they are seeing this as an onslaught by barbarians who only care about money and power. Um, the barbarians are the government and we're trying to defend this. Um, so, <coughs> I think it's really important for us to think about what other, what they, the people running things think of as a threat. Because a lot of times people in social movements, you know, you, we're very self-critical, we're very self-analytical, um, and we also have a strange tendency to almost get angry if somebody thinks they've accomplished something, you know. Uh, we don't want to like put on too much airs. We need to cultivate an air of, of, of realism, which I think is sometimes counterproductive because we don't notice how effective we can often be. I talked about this as a global justice movement. Um, global justice movement, a lot of people think the whole thing was a failure because it didn't destroy capitalism. But in fact, um, if you look at um, the way people were talking in 97, 98 when the whole thing started up, we don't even remember. You know, the rhetoric was anybody who doesn't think of this sort of supercharged free market, like um, war of all against all, financialized capitalism is the only possible way to run anything. If you objected to that, you were just treated as almost literally insane. Um, they had these treaties they were trying to create on a world scale which were going to sort of impose um, these r that principle on everything. Um, and within three years, they were just really well because um, at first the media totally resisted us when we started doing actions. Um, I was at age 16, uh, April 16th, 2000, and um, 
Washington, D.C., and we had these media packages. We had guys who had done like PR work. Uh, they were kind of defectors from the, uh, from the other side. They were trying the same techniques, and they would use these media techniques like, okay, take one phrase and use it over and over again whenever you see a reporter. Structural adjustment. Talk about structural adjustment. Bring, bring in structural adjustment. We were doing this. We just like had these lines you just say over and over again. And the media was like, yeah, we're on to you. No. <laughs> and they're like, no, the word structural adjustment did not appear in any uh, news report. Uh, we sent in op-eds, and op -ed, op -ed, zillions of op-eds from different people, well, all making the same points in different ways, and they didn't run any of them. They only run, ran hostile op-eds. Um, a year later, after a series of continued actions, suddenly the media turned around and said, you know, the kids were right. Yeah. Um, and then they, and all of the arguments that they wouldn't run in those op-eds that we sent in, suddenly started appearing in their own house on that editorialist <laughs> as if they'd made it up themselves. So they read them, you know, they keep this stuff, they think about it. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, even though we think of the global justice movement as this terrible failure, um, or a lot of people do, because it can completely destroy um, all forms of neoliberalism, but the global, the, globally the, the third world debt crisis basically ended. And the third world debt crisis basically ended because, partly because of the 98 crash, um, but largely because of Argentina, um, where there was a movement to delegitimize the government. It was basically based on the principles of the global justice movement, or so known as Case um, Vientos. There was an uprising. Uh, they threw out three governments in a row. And people decided, you know, fuck politics. We're just going to ignore them. Case Vientos is basically, you know, they could all go to hell. Forget all political parties. They're useless. They're irrelevant. We'll ignore them. We'll set up our own community assemblies. We'll occupy factories and set up our own economy. They're trying to set up an alternate currency system, um, alternate social institutions of every kind. It got to the point where politicians were like afraid to appear in public. You know, if they wanted to go to restaurants, they would put on phony mustaches <laughs> and beards. And anybody who saw them would start throwing food. Um, so the politicians realized, okay, we've got to do something. So they defaulted on the Argentine debt, and they never would have done normally. Set off a chain of events that almost bankrupted the IMF and ended the, uh, the global debt crisis. Um, so there were tremendous victories won through this sort of, through this direct action approach, um, and somehow. We're not prepared for victory. We're not really prepared for winning. We don't, we don't come up with long-term strategies. And in a way, the global, in, insofar as the global justice movement fell apart, partly it was because of 9-11 and the increased repression that came afterwards, but partly it was just because we weren't expecting to win that fast. You know, within two years, they just totally <coughs> changed their tune. And like structural adjustment was basically over. Um, all the trade agreements we were fighting had been abandoned. So this stuff can actually work. Um, and then I realized, well, okay, so maybe there is a reason that they're so scared of us. Um, but it was only after 9-11 that I realized just how scared they really are. And, and the thing that brought it home to me was actually the first major mobilization we had after 9-11. Because, you know, it was a, there was a big IMF World Bank thing that they were planning all sorts of rowdy direct action and you know, all of these great ideas. Then suddenly it's like, oh no, should we even do this thing? Um, and finally we decided, well, we had to show the flag. You know, there's all these people. So imagine you're an anarchist in Des Moines or some point in some little town where, you know, we must feel really scared and isolated in this environment. At least we could all get together and comfort each other. So we had this march. We didn't really do any direct action. Um, there was about, I don't know, 2,000 anarchists and 20,000 cops. Um, huge numbers of police, there were barricades, and, and, and um, heavy armament, riot cops. They stood up right next to the World Bank <coughs> building, which is interesting because the World Bank building, um, they never let us anywhere near it normally. And I realized why. It's entirely made of glass. Um, so, <laughs> um, so they parked us right next to the World Bank uh, building, and then they kettled us and wouldn't let us go for two hours. It was like, come on, guys, throw it uh, they really wanted to beat us up. And of course, we weren't that stupid. We just sat there for um, two hours. I think we tried to order a pizza to see if they'd let us do it. We were doing things to entertain ourselves. Finally, we negotiated something that let us go. We, we left feeling kind of miserable and, and, and powerless and, and defeated. And, um, 
didn't really do anything. And I thought, well, that's depressing. Until I talked to someone who was friend of a friend who someone who did it, the meeting. This is the IMF and World Bank, you know, two of the most powerful institutions in the entire world. Uh, and they were saying, yeah, I tried to go to the meeting, it sucked, it was horrible. I mean, like half of us couldn't even get through. There were 18 different layers of security, and there were barricades, and there were security checks at every point, and, 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 and half of us didn't even want to go. We just telecommuted, and they canceled all the parties, they canceled the ceremonies. Um, so they were just miserable. Um, I go, oh, these are the most powerful people in the world, right? And, and the police and the authorities were willing, and obviously getting permission from the highest possible um, level, were willing to completely destroy the parties of the most powerful pe some of the most powerful people on earth just so that 2,000 anarchists can have a miserable day. Now think about that for a moment. <laughs> they must think we're really important. I mean, what do they care if we have a bad day? And then I thought, you know, if that's the case, well, a lot of other things make sense too, like the war in Iraq which America lost, right? I mean, there's no troops in Amer American troops in Iraq. Iraq is now an Iranian ally. You know, you couldn't really lose more badly than that. Um, why did this happen? Well, you know, the reason why it happened was because the thing, the top priority of everybody planning the war in Iraq was to prevent mass protests on the, uh, that we saw, like we saw in Vietnam. You know, a lot of these guys who were in college during Vietnam, they remember this, they remember the whole counterculture. Um, maybe they even thought they were part of it at the time. Um, you know, so they were just like, whatever happens, we can't have something like that. So they came up with this formula. Um, this was widely brooded about in government circles. Like, for every American body bag, there'll be 20 protests. You know, they had some numbers. You know. um, so they had, tried, had to figure out a way to make sure as few Americans died critical injuries, they didn't mind so much, but death, yeah, um, dead Americans. Um, so they set up terms of engagement which would guarantee very few American deaths. The problem is the only way to like set up terms of engagement that would guarantee very few American deaths was to open fire immediately in all these situations full of civilians. So they ended up killing lots of women and children and then people ended up incredibly angry, you know, wanting to take revenge. Soon there was a vast thrill of course, nobody really liked them, everybody wanted them out of the country. Um, the way I put it is, you know, it's almost as if the American army in Iraq was ultimately defeated by the ghost of Abby Hoffman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These guys were so obsessed with not allowing some movement like that to happen. They didn't even care if they lost the war. So they don't care if they shut down the IMF meetings, you know, to prevent protests against that. They don't care if they lose the war in Iraq to prevent the mass anti-war movement. It starts making me think, well, maybe this is a systematic thing. Maybe this is the way the entire system is set up. They're so obsessed with preventing mass opposition because they realize they're intellectually bankrupt. That's the reason why they go after the education system. What could be more stupid than going after the education system here in the UK? I mean, what do we got, right? Um, they've already destroyed pop music when they got rid of the doll. Um, now they're going after the education system. I mean, what are they going to have left? Um, they're going after the arts. You know, all the, they prioritize ideological victory over um, actual <coughs> economic liability in every in every case. And if you think about that, that makes neoliberalism can be seen as essentially a political and ideological offensive against the idea of any alternative to capitalism, much more than it's a way of running capitalism itself. Because by all rubrics, it's a terrible way of running capitalism. And it's true, you know, precarious labor. Precarious labor does not produce more productive workers. It's quite the opposite. Um, but it's great if you're trying to depoliticize them. Same thing with having people work more and more hours. I mean, basically people get about three good hours of work in a day no matter how many hours they work. Um, but if you have them working more and more hours, they don't really have time to do anything else, like you know, create unions, get involved in politics, do anything, which um, takes them off their matrix. Um, so what we've got is a system which is entirely designed to preempt people doing what we're doing now. So much that we think of ourselves as a kind of marginal, helpless movement, the people running things do not think of us that way. They think of us as the major threat. 
Oh, so much so. I mean, another thing which I think is very telling, one reason that 9-11 seems to have happened was because they had so much of their intelligence resources spying on people like us. They weren't even bothering checking up on what all, uh, Osama bin Laden was doing. <laughs> that wasn't seen as the real threat. All right, so what? at least the people running the system seem to think that we're actually a threat to them in, in a way that we possibly can't imagine. And I think one reason that they see that is they realize the system's kind of going down. Um, every now and then, I get to talk to people who are actually part of the ruling class and think about long-term issues. Of course, most of them don't, right? They all go to business school and they're, they're trained to think about three years in the future. So they have no horizons, so they don't really care. Um, but the ones who actually do care, the ones who are, are thinking about what's going to happen 20, 30 years, you know, half of them are saying, okay, maybe capitalism, capitalism is going down the tubes. We should get on top of whatever the next thing is. What, what is it? Um, <laughs> half of them are really worried because they realize they're hitting three different walls at once. There's the ecological wall. Uh, there's the sort of debt financial thing that's obviously unsustainable. It's, it's rising inequality is unsustainable. Almost everything in the system clearly can't be maintained. Yet at the same time, they've ha had this war on imagination which has been so effective that it's about the only battle they've won. They've managed to preempt any sense that you can have effective opposition or that all their alternatives are possible. And as a result of putting all their emphasis on doing that, they've essentially put no em uh, emphasis on maintaining the system. It's currently falling apart. So everybody's sitting there saying, wait, capitalism is falling apart, but nothing else could possibly exist. <laughs> what are we going to do? Um, again, you know, some of those people in the ruling class actually realize this, and you know, this, I, they talk to me about it, and so I say, well, what do you think the next thing is going to be? I mean, we can get on top of that. Really, I mean, you know, these guys are talking to me. You know they know they're in trouble, I right? think. <laughs> um, so I think that there's a huge potential here, exactly in groups like that, because, uh, you know, this is where ideas come from. If you look at almost all the new interesting theoretical, philosophical, social ideas, they come from times when people who don't normally talk to each other start talking to each other. Um, where it's not just academics, but people involved in social struggles. And, uh, you know, Italian autonomy is a great example. So it was actually a time when people were working in factories and sort of student organizers and political activists or sat around together and tried to hammer something out and suddenly come up with a cascade of new intellectual ideas. And it's true of early Marxism. I mean, half those ideas we attributed to Marx didn't come from Marx. or just the sort of things that people were brooding about in cafes at the time. You know, we tend to attach these things to charismatic figures. That's our intellectual habit, but they don't come from individuals. So I think we have a unique opportunity here. Um, and. I wanted to end by saying something about imagination. A more profound, a more profound issue about imagination and violence that tells us something about the real political importance of what we're doing here. Um, it actually was a realization I had. I had to do with a car. Strange. Uh, I was in a group called the Direct Action Network. And the Direct Action Network in New York. Um, was a dispersed, um, decentralized, consensus-based, directly democratic network. Um, we pulled off a lot of really successful direct actions over the years. Um, and one time we had a bit of a crisis. Somebody gave us a call. We wouldn't think this would be a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, it's not much of a problem. But it turned out it was a big problem because if you have a car, well, you know, a dispersed, decentralized, consensus-based network can't own a car, right? You know, if you have a car, you have to be either an individual or you have to be a corporation. Um, and obviously, if we incorporated ourselves, we could own a car, we could own a nonprofit. But then we had to be an organization. We had to have a board of directors. We had to have a treasurer. And they stipulate exactly your, your organizational form you have to have if you're a corporation. So we didn't want to do that. Um, so we thought, okay, we'll just get one guy and he'll claim to own the car and really the car will be owned by the network. 
But then that didn't work because, like, he had to write permission for anybody else to ride it, and, you know, the car got hauled off. He was the one held economically responsible. And, it, and eventually, you know, the thing was just such a pain in the ass that we decided to hell with it. And we had a little fundraiser. Um, we gave up, you know, got a bunch of sledgehammers. Anybody gave a dollar to someone to smash up the car. And, you know, we made some money on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, we had to destroy the car. And I thought about this, and I thought, you know, this is really interesting. I think it gives a hint as to why people think that utopian forms of organization, democratic organizations, are somehow unrealistic. So everybody say, oh, you know, it's a nice idea, but it's not the worst unrealistic. Um, maybe what kind of reality are they talking about? Well, is it, you know, we have this constant problem. Whenever we get a large, heavy object, you know, that seems real, people think, um, then we have problems. Um, and it's not because it's more difficult to manage a large, heavy object um, democratically. The reason is because it's really hard to hide a large, heavy object from the authorities, and they regulate it. If you have a building, there's a code. If you have a car, you know, there's all sorts of rules about the insurance, about this, about that. It's all pretty carefully regulated. And, and, and the guys with the guns and the sticks and so forth can come and enforce it. And, and we're actually completely surrounded by thousands and thousands of tiny regulations that, that affect every aspect of our lives that we don't think about, because we don't like to think about violence. I actually realized this when I was in Madagascar. Um, I lived in Madagascar, an area where there were no cops. They basically pulled out of large parts of the countryside. Now, people were going about their business, more or less, you know, pretending the gov government was still there because they didn't really want anyone to know. So it actually was a sort of little anarchist enclave, except they were like smart enough not to put up a little flag and tell anybody. Um, and um, I said, I realized, you know, there's no rules about um, you know, how high a sign can be and all the different things we just assume are regulated weren't. So people had to kind of come up with these things, catch as catch can, um, using general sort of consensus meetings and agreements, and it worked okay. Um, but the other thing about Madagascar, though, is that they don't have a custom. Nobody's afraid to say when they're scared of things. So people would walk along and say, ooh, scary car. You know, ooh, scary cow. You know, and people don't do that here. You don't want to admit when you're scared of things. So for them, you know, the fact that, that regulations are enforced by scary people with guns and sticks and you're supposed to be scared of them uh, is something which nobody was particularly ashamed of. They thought it was kind of funny. Ooh, I'm scared of that. Um, and you know, it <laughs> made me realize that you know, we're, we're surrounded by these things that are threatening us with force, which is, of course, a euphemism for violence. Um, and, and we forget it's even there because we're embarrassed by being afraid. Um, but this is especially true of these big things. So, in a way, you know, the car is, is surrounded by rules because it's big, it can be identified, and guys with sticks and guns will come and. Um, round you up if you don't have your license plate right. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because we think of police, right? We think of police primarily as intervening in cases of violence. But of course that's not really true. Most of the cases of violence, the cops don't get involved. Cops will only get involved in violence if somebody's injured or killed because of the paperwork. Um, so cops are really about regulations and paperwork and documentation. Um, so you know, major things cops do is enforce all these tiny regulations. Some of these people, sociologists who follow cops around say this, but you know, maybe about three percent of things that police do on an average day have anything to do with crime. It's all this enforcement of little regulations of different kinds, but all with, you know, the threat of violence behind them. Um, so this violence gets absorbed into the things. We don't want to think about the fact that we're driving in a certain way, we're setting things up in a certain way, or we're organizing things in a certain way because people will beat us up if we don't or threaten to do so. Um, so the violence gets absorbed into the sense of reality of these big heavy things. And it's like the word real estate, right? You know what that's from? It's not from race meaning thing, it's from real meaning king. Real estate belongs to the king, you know, sovereign power. Uh, large, heavy things ultimately belong to the king, especially here, right? So London is owned by like, basically six people, and ultimately, you know, they get their power from the royal family. Um, so, made me suddenly realize that there's the real difference between the left and the right is an assumption of what could be called political ontology. 
in all fairness, I hate the word ontology and try to avoid it. Um, <laughs> but I think this is a legitimate use of the term. Um, in that, what I mean by ontology is what people think is really real. You know, when people say, oh, come on, let's be realistic, right? So um, take international relations. There's uh, institutionalists and realists, right? Uh, institutionalists say that it's like, you know, structures like the UN and treaties and, you know, uh, that create, uh, are the basis of relations between nations. Realists say, nah, it's all about force. You know, na uh, nations will pursue their self-interest through whatever means they have available. But the idea of a nation pursuing its self-interest, is that real? I mean, nations aren't real. They're fantasies. They're things that we say that exist because we say they do. The idea that a nation has an interest, like France's interest. And France doesn't even exist, let alone have an interest. I mean, there are people in France who control the government who have different interests. But, um, so, so it's absurd to say that's realism. Why does the French or British national interest seem real to us? Well, because it can kill you. You know, because it can martial violence. So it might as well be real because, you know, it can blow you up. Um, so ultimately, you know, real estate is real because it belongs to the state authorities who can beat you up if you say otherwise. Um, national interests are real because they can shoot you. Uh, and there's a sense, also, I think that's the key to right-wing political discourse, that the ultimate reality behind things is the reality of the violence and force. If there's, when people say, yeah, let's be realistic, what's really going on here? And what they're ultimately talking about is violence. The difference between that and left wing political discourse, the total tradition of the left, and this is what really is the distinction between the left and the right, is that when left people are saying, let's be realistic, what are they talking about? Like Marx, it's all about production. You know, somebody's making this stuff. We don't, we don't talk about that. We don't think about where this stuff comes from. Um, we see all these things as if they just appear out of nowhere. You know, so the reality is creation, not destruction, not violence. Um, so you can have the romantic versions. It's all about creativity. And you know, Marx just started with the romantic. You can have the productive version. But it's always a hidden reality that we're not supposed to talk about. It's like, well, what really runs an economy is production. What really runs society is our creativity. Where creating each other, creating people, creating uh, ulti the imagination, ultimately. And for Marx, you know, that's what makes humans different than animals. We imagine things first, and then we make them. So in a way, that's the difference between the left and the right. Uh, the right are the people who say, when they say, let's get realistic here, let's really lie behind things, ultimately it's violence. And the left tradition has always been that when you say what's really going on, it's imagination and it's creation. Um, I think that's really important um, to develop this notion in a, in a piece on superheroes. Mm -hmm. um, always thought it was very interesting that like the only people in, in a superhero story who are really imaginative are the bad guys. Think about it, right? Um, right. I mean, um, and, and, and there's this kind of process of identification because the only person who's actually trying to do something is the bad guy. The superheroes are purely reactive. They're boring. You know? All they do is fight crime. If you think about it, they're the most unimaginative people in the world. You know, if I could do anything, I would be just want to become a cop. <laughs> a vigilante cop. You know, I could do anything. Come on. Uh, but, you know, instead they just sort of sit around and wait for the villains to try to do something. And they have all sorts of ideas, you know, all uh, visions and so forth. But the implication is always seems to be that if you have imagination and apply it, on a sort of political level, the only possible result is disaster. So there's a further corollary, I think, to the left-right dichotomy. Um, the right think it's ultimately all about violence, and they also, uh, their take on imagination is conservatives think that if you apply imagination, the principle of imagination on the political level, it's only going to lead to an orgy of violence and destruction and chaos, and that's why they're against it. Fascists, on the other hand, feel that if you apply the principle of imagination on a social level, it will only lead to an orgy of violence, destruction, and chaos, and that's why they're for it. Um, the difference is that people on the left think it will actually lead to sort of positive change. Um, so, you know, ultimately, like, what do the superheroes do? Is all the, imagine the characters of the villain, they're bad. Uh, it can only lead to fascism. I don't think the superheroes are really fascists, but they're just like, you know, 
sort of decent guys in a world where fascism is the only political possibility. So, that, and there are imaginative that like like they contain their imagination within what their clothes, their cars, their, you know, their costumes, their 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 paraphernalia, basically you know the consumer domain. So that seems to be the message. Imagination has to be kept in the consumer domain. As soon as it goes out of that into a political sphere, horrible things are going to happen. Don't go there. Um, I think this is why those things are very um, uh, ultimately quite reactionary in their messages. Uh, and, and, and this is one of the million examples of ways that we're constantly told imagination is dead. You know, if you put, if you try to have a vision, if you try to present an imaginative politics, it will only lead to violence, and that's the ultimate right-wing message. Um, and in doing so, however, the ruling class seems to have been sufficiently successful in convincing people of this that they box themselves into a hole because they realize that there's no way out. I mean, they've, they've created a situation where some kind of radical visionary action of some kind is going to have to happen. Um, because clearly the system we got now is in the process of complete free fall, um, yet they completely made it impossible for us to even think what applying imagination, most people, what applying imagination to the broader world would even be like. So well, we have an advantage here. We're the only people doing it. And there's nothing to be more important than create spaces where, where we start doing that as rapidly as possible. Um, it doesn't matter if they're viable at first, you know. You just need as many ideas as possible, um, as quickly as possible, because God knows nobody else is producing. <laughs> Thank you.